Job 42, 10-17 After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortune and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over the trouble the Lord had brought on him, and each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuch. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children for the fourth generation. And so, Job died an old man and full of years. Welcome back to the final instalment of our study of Job. I'm Ian, and this is the Sailor Time to Pause podcast from Plexus Salvation Army, an online church in the UK. I will stop and breathe in your presence, just breathe. And so our journey with Job comes to an end. And like all good stories, it wraps itself up neatly in a bow. Through his story, we've seen him fall from a great height. We've watched him suffer terribly as he lost all his unimaginable wealth, grieved the loss of all of his sons and suffered with a painful and protracted illness that left him scratching at his boils and sores with broken shards of pottery. The greatest man in the East became the most afflicted man in all of history. And through it all, he remained faithful. In his grief and sorrow, he refused to curse God. In his pain and heartache, he refused to turn his back on the God he had served during the previous good times. In all things, he held on to his faith and continued to trust in God. When we first met Job, he had a huge number of sheep, camels, oxen, donkeys and servants, richer and of greater influence than any of us could think, richer than any around him. All of it was lost, but at the end, we see God's response to him. When all the accusations of Job's friends are done, and when Job had finished defending himself, the Lord had his say, and then he restores Job's fortunes and blesses Job's latter days more than his earlier ones. As his reward, he receives double what he lost. If his wealth was unthinkable before, it's now unimaginable. 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 female donkeys. God even gives him seven new sons and three new daughters to replace the seven sons and three daughters who were killed. And the three new daughters, we're told, were even more beautiful. With all now again well, we read the Jewish equivalent of happily ever after. And Job died an old man and full of days. What a rubbish ending. It seems to ruin the whole thing. One of the great things about Job's story is that it seemed real and relatable. It dealt with reality and I liked it for that. We know what it is to suffer, to grieve and for life to go wrong. To know that bad things can happen even to good people is reassuring. To know that it's possible to faithfully endure through any hardship is heartening. To know that others have made it through tunnels at least as dark and deep lets me know that it's not just me. I perhaps think that the story would have been better without this ending, because it turns this tale of reality into a fairy story. Because we know that happily ever after does not lie at the end of every story, and it does not await everyone. Sometimes suffering goes on until the end, and sometimes restoration does not happen. And what on earth is the bit about Job getting new children to replace the old ones about? It's not like upgrading a phone or replacing a broken biro. Love just doesn't work that way. Any parent who's lost a child would not just have another and then say, there we go, that makes up for it. No sweat, we can just forget about the last one. Not even if they're more handsome, beautiful and clever than the last one. When I read this fanciful happily ever after ending, 
I wonder if I've wasted my time in studying and wasted your time by preaching on the preceding 41 chapters, seeking truth in a fairy story, a scriptural fable, a biblical myth. Perhaps there was a slight moral to the whole thing, but were the details that I've looked deeply into these last few months just plot devices? No more important than the fact that the three bears left porridge on the table for Goldilocks instead of a Weetabix and a Kipper. The story of Job, is it nothing more and perhaps a whole lot less than an Old Testament parable? Anyway, at least Job lived happily ever after, so that's a good thing. When we're children, we like fairy stories, as they're easy to understand. But as we grow, we become more sophisticated and they no longer satisfy in the same way. As we grow, we can cope with more complicated narratives and we're able to probe deeper into the story for meaning and the messages and concepts they deal with can develop in their complexity. In time, a parent may want their child to be able to enjoy reading all sorts of literature, but the wise mother would not read the story of Anna Karenina at bedtime to her baby. A wise father wouldn't encourage the child learning to read to pick up Ivanhoe or War and Peace as their first story. No, stories will start with the billy goats trip trapping over a bridge or a very hungry caterpillar or a gruffalo. In time, they may read the exploits of the famous five or Alex Ryder or Harry Potter before moving on to George Orwell or William Golding or maybe even Shakespeare. But you don't start at the finish line. You have to get there gradually. It's just the same in teaching maths. You don't introduce someone to differential calculus before they can understand whether eight is bigger or smaller than five. You work up to it, understanding addition and subtraction and then multiplication and division and finally algebra at the very least. To neglect such an ordered progression in order to get to what the teacher may consider to be the good stuff would just doom a child to endure unintelligible squiggles being written on a whiteboard. Eventually they'd come to a worldview that simply says that maths is ridiculous magic. And they'd fail to understand that even if they find it difficult or dull, maths is a coherent system full of meaning. Faith and theology come the same way. We don't teach the inner workings of the Trinity to toddlers. We start with, God loves you, he made you special, and Jesus wants to be your friend. And it was no different when God was doing the teaching. The things that God has revealed were not all given at once. His revelation was given in stages, progressively. What at first is only obscurely intimated is gradually unfolded in later scriptures with increasing clarity. Perhaps the most obvious examples are those where Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. Jesus was not contradicting God's standard when he said such things. He was developing it further, taking it to the next step. Not killing is good, but restraining your anger is what you should aim for. Not committing adultery is good, but freeing yourself from the control of lust and a wandering eye is better. Loving your friends is good, but being able to show love even towards your enemies will give you a better life. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth prevented the escalation of blood feuds, but to turn the other cheek and walk the extra mile is a whole new standard. Failing to understand this step-by-step -step approach is what gives aggressive atheists their ammunition when they accuse the Bible of inconsistencies or retrograde practices. All things were moving on a step, but there was more revelation to come. That same lack of understanding is also, I think, one of the reasons why so many Christians claim to have a problem with the Old Testament. Because, in a sense, its theology is not fully formed as its events occurred during the time before God revealed himself to us in flesh. That's why the old adage of the biblical scholar becomes important. Context is king. Biblical stories occurred in particular moments in time, and the stories that were told to specific people at specific points in their lives, and they were told at specific moments in history. And that's true for Job's story just as much as every other part of the Bible. But Job's story occurs very early in the story of God's people. Humanity's understanding of God is still in its infancy, 
concepts of faith that we may consider to be fundamental have not yet developed. It's still a new idea that there is only one God who created all things and rules over the whole earth. All around the other nations believe in multiple tribal and regional gods who war in the heavens and with each other. Most significantly, the idea of an afterlife has not yet developed. The hints are there. A promised land over Jordan. A vision of a stairway to heaven. A city of God with a river of grace flowing from its heart. A story of a garden where man can dwell beyond the reach of death. With hindsight, they might seem plain to us. But humanity, coming to understand the promise of spending an eternal life in endless bliss in paradise with God, is over a millennium away. How, then, could God communicate a message of hope? How could he tell his people that faithfulness has its reward, that if they trust him, all will be well in the end? He needs to put it into concrete terms, and so Job receives restoration, restitution and reward. The ancient Jews who read Job's story would have known, just as we do, that the ending to the story is simplistic and is not real to each of our lives. Job may have received everything back double, but they'll have known that not everyone, not even all the faithful, will receive such material blessings in a long life. They may not have understood exactly what it was that God was promising, but they would know that God was saying, in some way, and though you may not be able to understand how, I want you to know that everything will be well. This is the promise that God offers to his people today. God's revelation of truth to his people has advanced that we can now understand things that would have been so totally alien to Job and his contemporaries. Life after death and eternity would simply have been beyond their theology, beyond any possibility of them understanding. And so the promise is offered in terms that they could understand. A restoration for all that's been lost. A restitution for all suffering and blessing greater than any has ever known. A reward for faithfulness in this life. And all of it beyond imagination. It's a description of the promise of paradise. And it can be ours. There is a hope that burns within my heart Gives me strength for every passing day A glimpse of glory now revealed in me good part Yet drives all doubt away I stand in Christ with sins forgiven and Christ in me the hope of heaven my highest calling and my deepest joy To make His will my home There is a hope that lifts my weary head Consolation strong against despair And when the world has plunged me in its deepest pit I find the Savior there the present suffering, future's fear He whispers courage in my ear For I am safe in everlasting arms And they will lead me home
that stands the test of time. Lifts my eyes beyond the beckoning grave to see the matchless beauty of a day divine. When I behold His face, when suffering ceases, sorrows die, and every longing satisfied, then joy unspeakable will flood my soul, for I am truly home. When suffering ceases. Sorrows die, and every longing satisfied. Then joy unspeakable will flood my soul, for I am truly home. Hello, this has been Sailor Time to Pause, a podcast from Plexus Salvation Army, an online church in the UK. I'm Ian. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Sam. If you've enjoyed journeying with us over these last few weeks, join us every Monday. Or any day that works for you. To spend time together, taking time out to pause, catch our breath, draw near to God and refresh our spirits. We share Bible teachings, reflections on songs we're listening to, and on what's going on in the world around us. As well as this, on the last day of the month, we look back and reflect, share any thoughts from our listener community, and ask what we can take from it into our daily living. What we call our personal So What's for the month. Join us, making us part of your regular routine, spending a few minutes to listen to what God might be saying to you. Find us on your favourite podcast streaming service, on Facebook or YouTube by searching for Selah. That's S-E-L-A-H. Time to pause.